So welcome to the pre-recording of lecture 30 of MCS 572. So this lecture continues our exploration of uh, parallel algorithms to solve large linear systems. In this lecture, we see one very useful method, uh, the method of Gauss-Seidel or Gauss-Seidel. And uh, we also indicate where uh, the large linear systems actually come from. So we will introduce a topic in scientific computing, uh, namely the algorithms to solve partial differential equations. So this is a course in supercomputing. Uh, it's largely overlapping in, in a sense, the big motivation for supercomputing is scientific computing but we actually are not really doing scientific computing. Um, nevertheless, with, uh, at the end of this lecture, I would like to um, announce a pointer to excellent software for doing scientific computing, uh, that is Petsy. And um, if you have to solve the heat equation, uh, if it really matters uh, to have a good and uh, a great solution, uh, then please consider uh, using the software that is available in Petsy. Uh, the goal of this lecture is mainly here to introduce uh, several of the main ideas uh, that go into uh, the algorithms for parallel uh, equation solving. Okay, so what do we have? Um, so we have a very large linear system that we want to solve in an iterative way. Um, so we have direct methods to solve linear systems. Think about Gaussian elimination, uh, QR factorization. Uh, but both these methods are going to do something to the matrix A. In many applications, in the partial differential equations, the matrix A has a very particular structure. And uh, with direct methods, we're going to destroy that structure. So, uh, also the other motivation is that in many applications, we have already an, somehow an approximation for a solution. And we want to refine it. So iterative methods can be constructed from fixed point equations. Uh, the construction of a fixed point equation is here outlined. We consider our matrix as the sum of a lower triangular, strictly lower triangular matrix, a diagonal matrix, and a strictly upper diagonal matrix then we can rewrite our original equation as a fixed point equation if we separate the lower triangular part, the lower triangular part which contains the L and the D, if we separate this from the upper triangular part. So um, the lower triangular systems can be solved more efficiently, so we will apply forward substitution in each step. So if we, we have already handled uh, the solving triangular systems in an earlier lecture, so in a way um, we are now repeatedly solving triangular systems in an iterative method. So for the iterative method to be well defined, all diagonal elements must be different from zero. So this is obvious if we look to the formulas. Uh, so the last time we discussed mainly and exclusively Jacobi's method, uh, which was a very nice example of uh, synchronized uh, computation. So also here, the methods that we are considering are synchronized, are examples of synchronized computations. The component-wise formulas are derived here. Um, in the case of the method of Jacobi, the component-wise formulas were kind of counterproductive in the sense that with Jacobi, we better work, we better think uh, with block matrices or strip partitioning of the, of the 
matrices. Here, actually, we have to think about the uh, component-wise uh, expressions of the algorithm. So the formulas uh, show the relationship between the two methods. Um, so um, the main difference being that with the method of Gauss-Seidel, as soon as we have an updated, a new update for a component of the solution, we are going to use it in the next update. So both formulas are now written row-wise, uh, so we are updating uh, the components of the solution one after the other. So, and in the Gauss-Seidel, we are using, in the update of the IT component, we are using all previously updated I-1 components. So this should be obvious from the J loop, from the first J loop in the sum. So that's the main idea. Um, here is the um, pseudo code for the um, algorithm. So uh, in order to make this into an algorithm, uh, we have to give an upper bound on the number of iterations, so that is the capital N. Uh, so the method will converge or not. Uh, if it doesn't converge, if it converges, then the loop will exit before K reaches the value of N. So there is this epsilon, which is a requirement on the accuracy. So then you see the two update uh, formulas, and we have the division by the diagonal element. So it makes clear that this method is not well defined if the diagonal elements are zero. Um, so this is uh, the algorithm derived directly from the formulas. In, in a way, this is an other reading of the mathematical formulas on the previous slide. In an actual implementation, you would not maintain two different uh, vectors. Uh, so here we have the vectors x, which are superscripted with the k. So the k is between the round brackets to indicate that this is not a power but it's just an indexation. So in this formulation of this mathematical algorithm, still we are maintaining a sequence of vectors, of solution vectors. This could be useful if you really want to monitor the evolution of the vectors. In practice, we typically print the magnitude of the update. Uh, the delta x, uh, its norm is an estimate for the forward error. Okay, so in the actual implementation, um, so we are going to fuse the two loops, so not really maintaining different uh, vectors, different approximations for the same uh, solution vector. We have one approximation for the solution vector. So um, there is only one loop. Uh, so each time when x i is updated, in the next iteration it is then used automatically. So it's important to, to, to realize this in the transition to the actual code. Okay, so I will use a C implementation. Um, so here you see the prototype. Uh, we have the number of equations, the number of variables, uh, so the dimension n, the matrix A, uh, the right-hand side vector B, and also what needs to be provided as the last parameter is a start vector for the iteration. Then there is the tolerance on the accuracy, the epsilon, and then the upper bound, the capital N, which is here called the 
uh, max it. So on return are the number of iterations. Already when the number of iterations returns equals the maximum number of iterations, you can tell that the accuracy has not been reached. Um, and then we have also the approximate solution. So this is a C implementation, uh, which has the um, sometimes the reputation for being a little bit too technical. Uh, but uh, the implementation of Gal Seidel that we are using here is so simple that it essentially fits on one single slide. So you see between the curly braces, that is all it takes to implement here uh, this uh, plain C implementation of uh, the method of gauss -Seidel. So it works uh, with a local uh, vector dx, um, which gets allocated and deallocated in each step. In an actual implementation, you would most likely have this as a separate argument, as the workspace. But here, for clarity, uh, it is better to have the dx uh, declared as a local uh, variable. And you see that the main bulk of the work goes into the computation of the matrix uh, vector product. So in a way, this looks very similar to the method of uh, Jacobi. Um, however, uh, each time when we are computing uh, the i dx, we actually are using it. So there is this loop, the double loop, the i loop and the j loop. So the i loop initializes the update with the right hand side. And then we have the first j loop. After the first j loop, i is zero. So we are going to update x zero. So for the next component, when we are computing x1, then x0 is already used. So the new x0 is being used. So this uh, corresponds to the method of gauss seidel being an in-place uh, method. Newer values are immediately applied. Uh, what is our test system? Uh, so for the method to converge, um, one condition is that the matrix is diagonally dominant. Uh, so here is a very simple test system where we take the sum of the elements. Uh, so we take a matrix of ones, we compute the sum of all the elements, which is n, the number of rows, number of columns, and we add that n to each each uh, diagonal element. So a matrix is diagonally dominant when the diagonal element is larger than the sum of all of diagonal methods. So the n plus 1 is larger than n, the sum of the elements on each row and each column, elements that are not on the diagonal. So under these conditions, the method of gauss seidel will converge. Uh, we also have an exact solution, so the right-hand side is computed, so that 1, 1, 1, 1, 1 is the exact solution. Uh, not knowing anything in our application here, we start the iterative method at the zero vector. Then we have two parameters. We are happy if we have four decimal places of accuracy, and we set the capital N on the number of maximal iterations rather large. So actually we do not want to have it that large. Uh, so uh, another way how iterative methods often beat uh, the direct methods is that they are quadratic in the dimension. And for the method of gauss seidel that will uh, be true. So in the implementation uh, the user can provide uh, the dimension. So here the uh, zero, zero, zero is a terrible uh, start. So you see that the delta x is uh, of the order 1264. Uh, but you see that in every iteration we actually gain one decimal place. Uh, so the method of gauss seidel converges rather fast, here with 12 iterations. Uh, so if you would do this on a uh, direct method, uh, you here we actually have 12 times uh, n square, 
operations, so 12 times million. Uh, but if you do this with the direct method, you would have a billion number of iterations. So 12 million versus 10 versus 1 billion is quite a difference. Uh, so we are uh, here certainly competitive with direct uh, methods. Um, last time we concluded that the method of Jacobi is seldomly used. And here is the justification. So you can see... The comparison with Jacobi, Jacobi needed 8,400 iterations to converge and 42 seconds. So here we are now in the uh, in the range of the milliseconds. Uh, so this was done on a 12 core 3.49 gigahertz computer. Um, I will repeat the specifications later. So these are historical times, um, but you can see that we are now in the magnitude already for a 1000 by 1000 matrix. We are in the magnitude of milliseconds. Uh, so it will be over before you know it. Very quick. Can we still have a speed up in this one? Um, and yes, we can. So we will you be using uh, parallel shared memory computers. Um, so we were using MPI um, to use a, an implementation on a parallel distributed memory computer. Um, that is quite convenient uh, because with the method of Jacobi, you can afford a very coarse granularity. So you divide the matrix into strips, uh, not knowing anything particular about the matrix. Uh, so we assumed dense matrices as in, this is in our test system. Uh, there is an entire literature and many, many software packages available that will partition sparse matrices. Uh, that is, again, an area of scientific computing. Uh, for uh, the purpose of this lecture here, if you would think about implementing the method of Gauss-Seidel um, on a distributed memory computer, then you would have a lot of communication overhead. So you can't really think about the row by row computation. So with Jacobi, we could think about entire blocks of the solution vector. And actually only during the synchronization, uh, then every processor needed to share its portion of the solution vector. Here, this is actually not possible. Here, what happens is that if the first processor would compute the first component, then the second processor would actually would need to wait uh, for that first component. So this would lead again to a pipeline computation. So this uh, on, a, on, a, on a, we've discussed pipelining before. Uh, so this could be another illustration how to apply pipelining, where your processors in the distributed memory environment would be lined up, and uh, the components of the solution would be piped through. And then you could have speed up if you would have multiple instances of a matrix to compute. Uh, we will not consider this here, and I'm digressing. So um, I should have uh, said that uh, we are going to work with a parallel shared memory implementation. And what follows now is also relevant for a distributed memory uh, environment. So what actually we are doing is doing a lot of parallel inner products. Uh, so and these uh, components of the parallel inner product, they can be happening uh, in a distributed way. So think about this. So you have a very huge matrix, uh, potentially millions of rows and columns. Uh, you are distributing the matrix over the uh, various processors. And then every processor computes one part of an inner product. So the uh, what gets ultimately distributed are the uh, which comes back are then the parts of the inner products. So what we will consider is a finer grained uh, implementation on a parallel shared memory computer. And we don't need to consider millions and billions of uh, equations. It will already work if we are working in the range of 10,000s. 
So what happens? Um, every thread computes one part of the inner product. Um, so, um, and uh, then the big delta x. So every thread will have its portion of the inner product, and then the uh, total inner product will be updated in a critical section. Here is the picture. Uh, so assuming that we are working with a number of rows and columns divisible by three, think about 3,000, then uh, with three uh, threads, uh, the first thread will do the first 1,000 uh, products and 1,000 uh, sums as well. And then the second thread will do the next 1,000 and the third thread will do the third 1,000. So you can see that there is already uh, a lot of arithmetic happening by three threads for a matrix of 3,000. <coughs> um, what is shared is the X uh, and the rows of the matrix. Uh, what is um, local to each thread, and that can be stored in one register, uh, is the own variable that the thread is using to accumulate um, what is now the part of the inner product. And in a critical section, so there will be then, in this case with three threads, there will be three additions to compute the value of the inner product. And that is updated in one critical section. The critical section has only one update. So only one computation gets done in the uh, critical section. Okay, so here is then the parallel implementation with um, OpenMP. Um, so this is a C implementation um, and a strictly C implementation where there are some extra variables. So the i, j, and the k uh, are, uh, there are now three additional variables, id for the thread identification number, and then the index where every thread starts and stops in the computation of the inner product. So it is in the j loop, so there is the j start and the j stop. There is also an extra variable, this is the dnp, uh, that is the portion, that is the division of n by p. So here, for this to work, I'm assuming that the dimension is divisible, exactly divisible, by the number of threads. So this makes the code uh, simpler. So this is in preparation of the OpenMP. And then comes the parallel region, where the threads collaborate uh, at the making of one inner product. So the code itself uh, does not have to modify much. Uh, so there is the J start and the J stop in the uh, segment of the inner product that is computed by each thread, each thread with a unique identification number. So each thread has its own private local variable, the identification number, its own, ident its own name if you like. It has the index j that is uh, private, that, and then the index of the start, the index of the stop. And then there is also the update variable. So if this is executed by three threads, there will be three copies of J, three copies of the start, three copies of the stop. And they can all be stored in registers, so registers that are local to the threads or to the tasks, if you like. So this is done in a parallel region. Um, so OpenMP is in that sense very useful to use, uh, especially if you are uh, familiar with C enough. Um, there is the Julia implementation, which I will not provide here, um, but in some sense the critical section is something that we have covered already. So Julia provides the atomic updates. 
so the declaration of atomic variables. Uh, so you would declare a sequence of atomic variables for each dxi. And that would then update uh, the i'th uh, component used for the i'th component in each step. Um, okay, um, that is essentially it. Um, so in some sense, uh, this code is rather old. Um, it was one of, and it still works, I tried it today. Um, so it's one of my earliest successes with OpenMP. Uh, just to indicate that nothing else uh, changes. So there is the synchronization. The synchronization with parallel shared memory is actually happening because we leave the, 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 the parallel region. Um, in a way, this is very hard. Um, so if uh, the threats can be launched... Um, rather quickly. Um, if you want a better implementation, you would work with multitasking and actually leave uh, the parallel region at the outside and then launch tasks and do task synchronization. Um, but um, what I also want to indicate is what we do not uh, make in parallel is the uh, update, uh, so the division um, so these are the I instruction and also the update, uh, which is just one. And so this, these are two floating point instructions. And then each time we also update uh, the, um, the, the, the norm of the update vector. So the estimate for the forward error, which is used then in the stop test. So just to indicate that the update instructions are all constant. Um, so, and there's not much need to have this done in parallel. Okay, so uh, this was done on this 12 core. So this is an old uh, processor, already 10 years old, still running. Um, see the specifications. Um, what this is good is to indicate um, also the scalability. So scalability is good for two threads. Uh, so we get to 1.8 as we let the n grow. It's not so good anymore. The 30,000 is not so good anymore uh, with 10 threads. Um, so you should use uh, larger problems if you are using more computing. Um, time. So if you use more threads, uh, use larger problems. Uh, so this is again uh, the analysis that we also did uh, for the Jacobi method. So here I leave the experimental uh, verification to uh, an exercise. But you can see the effectiveness. Uh, so the code is very simple. Um, if you understand the sequential C version, then the update is quickly made to the OpenMP version. And you get already very good speedups on uh, a very low dimension, so these days 10,000 equations um, and variables is not that large anymore, uh, also on a very few number of threads. So this is personal um, parallel computing, if you like. Okay, so let's now uh, go to scientific computing and consider a very uh, useful uh, partial differential equation. Uh, this is called the heat equation or also the equation of diffusion. So this model can also be used for all kinds of other uh, phenomena. If you think about the diffusion of traffic, uh, can also be used there. So extremely useful model. Uh, it is derived from physics uh, to model the temperature distribution. So here over a uh, spatial domain, uh, we use X and Y. So the equation essentially says that the temperature distribution in time uh, depends on the uh, shape of the spatial distribution. Um, so 
I haven't pictures here, uh, but you should think about here originally a bell-shaped course and how this actually diffuses uh, the uh, one can have a spike uh, if you think about a cloud of smoke how this gets diffused over an area uh, we will be studying uh, the first uh, diffusion equation so there are also uh, equations which don't involve time um, so these are the Laplace and the Poisson equations which are equally very interesting to study um, so to make this uh, problem well defined uh, for numerical computation we must turn this into uh, we must provide initial conditions uh, so for everywhere for time zero we must uh, define what the temperature distribution is uh, so typically one has a profile one has a, br a heat profile one can think about the cooling off model when uh, the temperature over the domain so here our domain is very simple square uh, tile of 0 1 and one can think of a constant function f for a constant temperature and one can consider what happens when one starts to heat up or when there is a cooling down with the boundaries so we have uh, four boundaries so x equals 0 x equal 1 so these are the two the upper and the lower boundaries if you consider uh, the traditional Cartesian domain x0 is the lower boundary x equals 1 is the upper boundary given by the functions g1 and g2 functions in y and then you have the left and the right, right left and the right boundary conditions given uh, by the functions g3 and g4 uh, so this is a numerical solution one can provide explicit functions but it suffices to know uh, the values of these functions at the grid points okay so we will compute the numerical approximation for the solution and discretize uh, so we will subdivide our square tile into uh, grids and we will um, so first I should say that this is a time stepping a time involution we assume that we know the temperature at x naught y naught and we take uh, the um, approximations for the derivative in time uh, by here forward differences and we use uh, backward differences combine forward and backward differences to approximate the second derivative um, so we are having values uh, at uh, any point x naught y naught so the finite differences allows us to approximate the second derivative by making a linear combination of the value at the point at a specific time t naught looking up and down so thinking again of the cartesian rectangular formation where x is the horizontal axis you go up when you do x naught plus h you go down when you do x naught minus h so this is the approximation for the second partial derivatives in the equation we do the same for the y so i don't have the for i have the formulas here so um, we have the forward differences also for time so we have the finite differences for space x and y and this uh, leads then to e, an explicit uh, formula where we compute the new values in time for t naught plus h from the values at t naught uh, so we have the h square so h is typically very small um, so if you want an approximation error of say six decimal places then pick h uh, 10 to 
the power, power minus 3 if you want this, those but the h so is 10 to the power minus 3 so you are h your h is the spacing between two points in your tile between 0 and 1 so one, 10 to the power min minus 3, 1 over 1,000. So you very quickly have a 1,000 by 1,000 linear system. And this if you can then have at most uh, six decimal places correct. So there are other conditions that apply here. I will uh, get back to those later. So, um, so where do the linear systems coming in? Well, let us summarize first. So I was uh, talking about the 10 to the power minus 3. Um, so the 10 to, uh, to the power 3 minus 3 translates into 1 over n, where n will be the total number of grid points that you have. Or let's say the n minus 1 are the inner grid points. The i equals 0, i equals 1 will, will, will be the outer grid points. So the Outer grid points are given by your boundary conditions, so the G1, G2, G3, G4. So we have this uh, grid, uh, which is here very simple to find for our division uh, of the uh, square tile, uh, 0, 1. Uh, we have uh, also for simplicity, we use the same step size. Uh, in time as in space and this should not be done i will come back to that in a minute um, so we have then this uh, formula for update so in each step we update the next value in time based on the current value so the u i j k and then also the neighboring parts um, you see also where diagonally dominant matrices come in. So in this formula here, uh, you see that the diagonal element is 1 minus 4h. And the off-diagonal elements are actually 4 times h. So the h is typically very small. So you can see that diagonally dominant matrices, which kind of seemed rather far-fetched when we talked about this, occur here very naturally. So the convergence is then also guaranteed. Um, so this slide here makes the connection with the method of Gauss-Seidel, what we have considered earlier, or also with the method of Jacobi. So actually, if you are going to do the updates according to the formulas, the formulas that immediately translate into a straightforward algorithm, then essentially you are running Jacobi's method. Um, and you will have to be satisfied with the slow uh, convergence. But if you are using the most recent values, then as in the method of Gauss-Seidel, you can have a faster convergence. Now, this is a very specific problem. Uh, this is a very specific uh, method, and we can do a lot better. Um, so there is a very specific ordering of these updates that can be done and uh, that is defined uh, known as the red black ordering of the points um, so you have the update of each point uh, has four neighbors so e every black point has four red neighbors every red point has four black neighbors. So we can uh, iterate. So this is a binary uh, step. Um, so in one step, you update the black points with the red points. In another step, you update the red points with the black points. So this is a very natural and a very convenient way of working for this specific uh, discretization of the heat equation. And this is called the red-black ordering. Uh, this is also a lecture on domain decomposition. So uh, I'm considering a very uh, simple grid. Uh, so we are just having one tile 
or if you're considering the heat uh, distribution in a room, which is just a square room, uh, then uh, you can uh, partition the dots, uh, which are again colored in red and, and, and black, and you can uh, partition this in strips or you can partition this in squares. Um, so if you are partitioning this in strips, uh, then if you think about this, there are more boundary regions that must be shared. Um, so that will be uh, made a little bit more specific in the next slide. Um, <clears throat> so what needs to be shared? Uh, what needs to be communicated if you are considering uh, distributed memory um, application? What needs to be shared are uh, the uh, boundaries of the tiles. Uh, so the picture here at the right shows uh, what needs to be shared. So the picture is very coarse, uh, so you wouldn't normally not do this on a 12 by 12 matrix uh, just for the purpose but of the of the uh, idea but you see uh, that the number of boundary elements that need to be shared is n divided by the square root of p um, and this looks better uh, than the n over p as will be made clear in the next slide so if you think about uh, the uh, a parallel uh, distributed memory uh, implementation, then the communication cost of strip partitioning uh, depends on the startup time. Uh, the cost for one, um, so this is here uh, with uh, strip partitioning uh, for four processors with eight processors uh, the strip partitioning becomes already a lot uh, better um, so that's the conclusion of uh, this slide um, so the uh, it's essentially a summary um, so there is the uh, communication cost where you have the sends and the receives. So that's why you have the multiplication cost by two. Um, okay, um, that's mainly it. Um, except that um, the treatment here uh, of the uh, solving of the heat equation was rather uh, rudimentary as um, somebody who has taken a numerical analysis course would realize. However, this is not a scientific computing course. Uh, so just some words of caution here. Um, the method that we have seen is explicit, which makes it extremely convenient to implement, which we didn't do, by the way. Um, but if you implement this, you would be you would have to have extremely cautious about uh, the uh, time stepping uh, discretization step uh, because you would incur diversion, uh, the, the divergence. So this method is not conditionally stable. Um, so I was mentioning the accuracy of the finite differences. There are also the conditions that must be met for this explicit method to work. So methods that are unconditionally stable are actually implicit. And uh, they actually are solving, involving the solving of a linear system in each step. Which was actually something that we did with the method of Gauss-Seidel. Uh, so in some sense, the methods that we have seen with the red-black ordering might not be that naive after all. Okay, so my time is almost up. Uh, let me point at the literature and in particular to software. There is uh, Petsy. Uh, Petsy, which is a uh, standard for scientific computing, for parallel scientific computing, and in some sense the two words parallel and scientific computing are kind of morphed into each other. 
So there is the website that is mentioned here. Uh, there is the Advanced Computational Software Collection, um, which was defined uh, in this paper here. So this would be the point for uh, the starting point for the suggested reading. Uh, the middle uh, bullet is the website, and uh, most likely uh, you will get overwhelmed um, if you are starting to browse whatever is available there. Uh, there is the recent paper uh, that um, indicates uh, the community as an infrastructure, um, which is a very nice starting point to read as far as a software engineering perspective. So Petsy is also the uh, an example of a very successful software engineering project. Uh, so if ever you have to solve uh, uh, PDEs, um, not for just knowing how the ideas are working, but for real, if you really care about an actual modeling project, then um, strongly recommended to consider Petsy. So in this course, uh, we are following an undergraduate textbook uh, because of the diverse backgrounds and for the openness of the course, uh, not only suitable for scientific computing. So we have introduced um, some of the topics again with scalability. Um, so we have the uh, you can consider uh, the red black and then the uh, domain decomposition for the um, gauss seidel method uh, so you can also look at what the openmp uh, implementation of the gauss seidel method does on your laptop um, so um, in some sense, the first exercise is a synthetic exercise. Um, examine the scalability. Um, if you are into programming, uh, you can use MPI, the Julia version. You can MPI for Pi uh, to develop a parallel version on a distributed memory uh, parallel computing. Uh, Petsy should install fairly well. Uh, there are many tutorials available. Um, look at how the uh, heat equation is solved there. Um, so in an earlier run of the course, I had it installed. Uh, this is also the last portion of the course now, and it would be a great uh, final project to actually uh, study uh, Petsy. Um, um, Wilkinson and Allen uh, mentioned the cellular automata as another great example of synchronized uh, computation. So cellular automata are known, for example, the Conway's game of life. Um, vectorization is suitable for that, as we have explored in an earlier scientific software course. Um, think about how to develop a very efficient parallel implementation of the game of life, uh, which is a game, but there are some very serious applications of cellular automata out there. Okay, so this is my last slide. I hope this lecture was interesting and was self-contained enough uh, to give several ideas, um, impressions of ideas, how parallel computing applies uh, to problems in scientific computing. In the next round of lectures, we continue synchronization, but we continue with GPU acceleration. So how to accelerate uh, the method of Gauss-Seidel, so on a GPU, you would need to compute many, many inner products. And in the next lecture, the focus will be on parallel reduction methods, but then on a graphics processing unit.